Tillo, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are live. So you can come join us if you want. If not, that's cool. Just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. If you happen to miss the live and you're looking for any type of like highlights and things of that nature, it'll be on this channel right here. Uh, the Lit One Live. Um, also, if you can do shorts, if you know how to do shorts, if you know how to edit and things of that nature, I want to give somebody access to this channel so they can go freely upload the stuff by themselves. Like upload shorts and upload, you know. Of course, I oversee it, but, you know. Let's work together. When, it's, when this channel becomes monetizational, we split the profit. Of course. Simple. Uh, we also got the Patreon, of course. A lot of stuff going on over there, of course, every day. Uh, it's where we react to stuff that we can't react to on YouTube. And we got the Discord. Let's get into this, though, man. The murder of Jill Dando. April 2nd, 2019. Okay. Hopefully they let me post it. I'll be sad. But if they don't, you know where it's going? <laughs> Patreon. It's all right. Okay. She was my younger sister. Okay. We didn't share too many experiences together because, because of the age difference. But I remember we, we, you know, we shared times, picnics on Western Beach on a on a Saturday or a Sunday, family picnics. Shout out to the first responders in the chat. I mean, in the uh, in the premiere too, man. Thanks for hitting that like button, man. It's important. Wait, this film is about the one of the nation's most famous television presenters. Who? Oh, I've never even heard of Jill. I look at the monitor there. Who's that old git with white hair? I still, I still can't get used to it. I'm Nick Ross, uh, a broadcaster. At least I was a broadcaster for 40 years. Don't do much of it now. Jill was my cousin. She was, um... She... This is a good-looking old lady. Okay, let me focus. She was, um... Many of these people are sharing their experience for the first time. Okay. I'm Hamish Campbell, and I was the detective chief inspector in 99 and the senior investigating officer for the murder of Jill Dando. We, the Metropolitan Police writ large, investigated that case so thoroughly, you know, to the end of our ability and examined so much to try to come to a conclusion and we're now 20 years later I think it is relevant in one way to hear a perspective from the from the police to give a perhaps a, a view on it from a from a 20 year distance Good morning from Jill and me. You're watching the BBC's Breakfast News. More of that in a moment, but here's Jill with something else. <laughs> Struggling Hello. away. Hello. <laughs> Jill started on BBC Breakfast Time, and then she was on the six o'clock news, and you almost, I think, you get promoted within the news hierarchy. Also in this morning's programme, more dockers are at work than on strike. The Queen, in her Christmas message, has said she will pray for peace around the world. That's it. The next national news is, of course, the 9 o'clock news. From the 6 o'clock team there, good evening. Good evening. We were a double act on the 6 o'clock news, I suppose. As far as the audience was concerned, Jill was a friend dropping in. Um, more so than any other newscaster I think I've ever known. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. I've now got something in my eye. Hello. At the end of the last series of Holiday, I was in New Orleans. She'd always thought how lovely it would be to be on the holiday programme, for instance. Can I just check again? I just want to just check something. And then when that came to fruition, 
Jill couldn't believe her luck that this thing that she dreamed of being on had been offered to her. We were just watching at home, thinking, oh, yeah, there's Jill on the telly. She was presenting, she'd done breakfast, she was on the holiday programme, which was huge at the time, Crime Watch, the same, a lot, you know, millions of people were, were, were watching it. She had this interest in doing something in TV from a very early age and uh, achieved her ambition uh, quite spectacularly. Good evening and welcome as people all over the country are joining together once again to solve some of Britain's most difficult and serious crimes. It all depends on you. And together we've... we've Jill wore many... high heels on the programme. And when she wore high heels, she was taller than I was. Easy to upstage me. In the last shot of Crime Watch, we come together and say good night to the camera. Don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. And as she came in on that first programme, she quietly kicked her high heels off so that she wasn't taller than I was. She did that every single show. Good night. 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 At the time, I was uh, director of news uh, for the BBC, and um, I first saw Jill um, when she was presenting Spotlight. I'm sure it was Spotlight in the Southwest. We were immensely lucky because you had someone there who just had this really special connection with audiences. It was remarkable. I'm sorry. I was fiddling around with my earpiece. People saw the, the, the talent that she could bring and the natural character that, that she had. She, she never had any airs or graces. So what have you been doing on board? Oh, eating. <laughs> In the last two years or so of her life i would she was like a very likable person like very charismatic very respectful in her own ways you know what i'm saying i like her say that jill went from being competent to being a star she arose and looked amazing she was i would say in command then she was powerful Hollywood, Los Angeles, the greatest wannabe city in the world. The Damn! Success. Greatest wannabe city in the world? Surprised her. But she, I don't think, ever really gave herself credit for just how good she was. There was a lot of razzmatazz, and there was a lot of celebrity events, prize givings. She was going to these amazing places. She was staying in amazing hotels. She had all these lovely outfits. But that doesn't mean to say she didn't forget. She still retained that girl next door uh, persona, which was absolutely the person that she was, and she didn't change. So until next week, goodbye. day I walked up my road, took my usual route up Gowan Avenue. Whoever it was picked a very quiet time in order to be able to do what they did. Well, I crossed over the road. And then I saw Jill's car. I looked at her front door and then I saw She was outside? Like, she was outside with it? Like, first off, like, she was a very notable TV personality. I feel like she might have lived in an affluent neighborhood where this might not happen. But, like, at, at a certain level of celebrity, I feel like everybody should move to, like, a gated community. Like, somewhere with security. Like, that, like this is cool, but, like, just having a doorman at the bottom that can't get in that, that they have to call you and let people in and they bring your mail up, like all of that, like high rise buildings is needed at some point. You know, this is my personal opinion. Right here, I feel like she's too accessible. 7, 8, 3, 1.
Zero, thank you. Ambulance service, hello. Hello, ambulance. I'm walking along Gowan Avenue. It looks like um, there's somebody collapsed um, confidentially. It looks like it's Jill Dando, and she's collapsed in her door. There's a lot of blood. Could you just approach and check that the lady's breathing for me? She doesn't look as if she's breathing. Like. She's got blood coming from her nose. Her arms are blue. I just need to find out if she needs, if she's breathing. Is the lady's chest going up and down? Oh my God, no, I don't think she's alive. Wow, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, no, I'm, don't worry, I'm going to get some help there as fast as I can. April 26, 1999. Miss Dando's body wasn't there. That had already been taken by the ambulance service. I still thought it was a stabbing, and it was quickly established. I understood it, you know. Whoever it was had been shot. She got shot? We could see the nature of the contamination that was being conducted by the ambulance crew. But yeah, there was a limited forensic field there. The fact that it was Jill Dando created an immediate media interest and a lot of news. But it, obviously we had to wait for formal identification. And there was a police officer at the hospital, and then he confirmed to me that it was her. Damn. Between quarter to 12 and 12 o'clock, the body of a woman was found outside number 29 Gowan Avenue. That woman has been taken to Charing Cross Hospital, and that woman has been declared dead shortly after 1 o'clock. That woman has been identified as Jill Dando, the television presenter. I can't believe she got shot, though. Like... Jill was 37. Yeah. No, she was 37. Jill was 37. 37. Peter, I'm telling you, she was 37. All right. I told her she was 37. She was exactly two years younger than me. She was 37. What should I say? I'm telling you, she was definitely 37. Definitely. Here we go. Within the past few minutes, police have confirmed that the BBC television presenter, Jill Dando, has been stabbed to death outside her West London home. She died in the ambulance on her way to hospital. There are no more... Oh, she was alive upon a, the, when they got there, she was alive. Okay. But then she passed away in the ambulance. I'm saying okay like it made a difference, but I'm just... Details at the moment. The next scheduled bulletin as, is at 2.40. It mattered so much to us to deliver the news accurately about one of our own. Oh, that was you? Honestly, it mattered so much to us. Okay, yeah. It, it was so dreadful and is so dreadful to have a, a personal friend murdered on her doorstep. It's just, it just makes my blood run cold even now. It's just awful. Jill Dander arrived here by... See, that's what I'm saying, like, 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 I get it, that's an affluent neighborhood, you would never expect it to go down like that in that neighborhood, especially, like, gunshot, like, but, like, living in a high-rise, man, there's a positive, there's a good, there's a, there's a move to it, there's, like, nobody can just get up there, it's secure, you know what I'm saying, or living, like, in a gated area, like, I'm pretty sure she could have afforded it. That's just my just the way I was to thinking. Like if I was to ever move to London or the UK, I'm in an I'm I'm living in the high rise. I don't care. I, I, like come yeah, I got I'm in the high rise. I'm chilling. Top not the top floor, but I'm in there for sure. By ambulance at 12:30 p.m. Despite all efforts by ambulance paramedics and hospital medical staff. She was certified dead at 1.03. Like, out here, I can kind of move freely. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm not known. To, nobody know who I am here. But if I go there, I'm, people know who I am. People are mad at me because I do reactions. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm in a high rise. And I'm finding out a way to get my gun there. That's just me. Whatever I got to do to be able to have my blick there and be able to carry it, I, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Her injuries were so bad that police were unable to tell immediately if she'd been shot or stabbed. My two sisters um, came and knocked on the door 
and they said um, there's been a terrible accident um, and Jill's been stabbed, um, which, which is what hey. the news was saying at that time. Then I think I said, um, is it serious? Where is she? How serious is it? Um, and, and that's when they said she's dead. Um, so... This is her sister? Obviously that was, you know... Not only the immediate family, but a lot of other people in Western and the, and the Western area who are going to be deeply, deeply saddened by what's happened today. As far as my dad's concerned, I mean, she was a devoted daughter and, for me, a sort of loving sister. That shock, the shocking news, I mean, when it's a close relative like that and you're told that that person has, has died in those sort of circumstances and then suddenly they're no longer there, you had to front up and, and, and pay tribute to Jill, which is the least she deserved in that moment. I can't believe we're talking in the past tense about her. She was somebody who had such fun of Eve, such, you know, passion about life. Uh, she was everything one could want in a colleague and a friend. I swear, bro, like, I feel like this is like a story of somebody just hating. Somebody was just hating on Jill. Like, this is what I'm feeling right now. Like, somebody was hating hard. People hate to see you doing good. People love to see you doing good, but not better than them. Like, somebody hated on that level. Like, that's crazy. A call from a friend of mine, newspaper editor, who said he was sitting down. Told me the news. And that's the main news tonight, the brutal killing that today stunned everyone here at the BBC Television Centre. A senseless murder that leaves this newsroom in which she worked a darker place and makes a lot poorer the medium which she graced. Good night. Motive. Good afternoon. Officers leading the hunt say five people saw a well-dressed man near Jill Dande's flat about the time of her murder. She was shot with a 9mm semi-automatic pistol which can't be legally held. The tributes here on the flowers echo the overriding reaction of shock that has met the news of Jill Dando's death. Thousands of people have been sending messages of sympathy to the BBC. Many are from people who never met Jill Dando. The nation took an interest in a, in a murder investigation in a way that you see in other cases, but this somehow felt quite personal, I think, for many people in society. It is continually on the national radio. It is continually on London radio. It is now recaps of Jill speaking back to you through the TV screen, even though she has passed. Oh, that was wonderful. Wave after wave of information and outcry and empathy. Damn, I was on every one of those newspapers. But the, she was, that's crazy. You said... Things like um, a 7-7, a 9-11, they're a different scale. This was a single fatality. This was one murder. But it was the victim, it was the circumstance that made it one of the biggest cases, if not the biggest case of its time. Damn. She had done a huge amount, personally, in the fight against crime by her role, not least, in Crime Watch UK, and therefore this makes her death all the more poignant. It was mentioned in Parliament uh, by Jack Straw. Tony Blair came forward to, to talk about it because this is such an extremely rare event. Everybody in the newsroom was saying, why, why, why? How could this possibly have happened to Jill? The police admit it looks like a professional job. The circumstances make it look like it's a professional hit, but you, we just cannot exclude somebody who has a revenge or a grudge. Just make sure y'all do the, 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 the adequate amount of policing because y'all got a reputation of not doing that. So just go do the police work and don't leave no stone unturned. How about that, sir? Roger has been stalking. Any number of, of possibilities are open as to why Jill Jando was murdered yesterday. Narrow him down. Have been a stalker or a professional hitman. But every possible motive is being looked at. These are the decision logs that I wrote in the inquiry. Much of these logs have not been seen by anybody. They've been seen by the police, they've been seen by the courts, 
and the defense, but they remain invisible. I look back, there was a lot of pressure there in that, even in those early hours and days, and there was a lot of people calling me. Yeah, I think I should tell, hold on, let me, I didn't tell nobody I was live, but I didn't even, let me see. Story, 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 story. I'm on Twitch live. Link is in the my bio under my picture in that link tree. Just hit Twitch. It'll bring you straight to me. All right, bye. Wait, go on. me directly and the media and through the press office and through senior command giving ideas and suggestions as to who killed Jill Dando. Here we have no clear motive at all as to why kill Jill Dando. What has been achieved by killing her? Revenge, revenge. That's what I'm saying. Like, what, what was the point? It's some hate. Somebody's hating. For what? Money, sex, jealousy, ex-boyfriends? Business, television, secrets about to be revealed, criminals, her crime watch work. Was there more than one person which we didn't know about? Either Jill Dando was murdered by a single person as an individual operating on their own, or she was killed by an organized gang. What motivates a killer to kill in broad daylight? This isn't in the middle of the night. This isn't some dark alleyway. This was one of the highest risk murders that you could probably do. Is that a trained killer or is it an absolutely chaotic killer? And the, here's, the, the, here's the crazy part. It was a nine millimeter semi-automatic pist semi pistol. That's, a, that's just a nine. Out here in America, that's like a Glock or, or whatever, 1911, whatever, whatever, Nina Beretta, whatever. Broad daylight, right? Broad daylight. Nobody heard it? Somebody just happened to be walking and stumbled upon her. Nobody heard that? So with that, no, you're going to hear that in that neighborhood. <laughs> you're going to hear that. You might hear that two blocks away, three blocks away. Now, here's the crazy part. Nobody heard that. So was there a silencer on there? So that, so that alone, like the way so far that we, like we're only 15 minutes in, but that right there like frames it to me as... It could have been for hire because nobody hears that out outside point blank range broad daylight nobody heard a semi-automatic nine millimeter pistol go off even almost i want to say even with a silencer it's still you still gonna hear it a little bit don't let the movies fool you <laughs> still pretty loud just questions i got man driven by the emotion of the moment. All of those facets have to be worked through. And, and I say this because I've been shot at this close, <laughs> like not this close, but like pretty close. So I know what it sounds like. <laughs> so like, it ain't no way. Ain't no possible way. Do you ever get worried about some of the things you see on Crime Watch? Oh, yes, you do, because you hear of such terrible people in this world doing terrible things, and that's what worries me, is, is the mentality of some people that can actually do those awful things. So, yes, I do. Did you, the pair of you, feel that you, you might get into trouble as a result of doing this? After all, you were attempting to nail fairly villainous individuals. I don't believe there is any connection, a crime watch connection with, with her killing. Right from the beginning, there was this assumption there's something to do with crime watch. Damn. To go for somebody who's just the messenger. Well, why? Because it's a crime program, sure. But I mean, why not because of the holiday program she was doing? Why not because of any other program? Why not just because she was famous? Nah, that's this is where <laughs> nah, that, that's, this happens. It's like when I react to music and people get mad at me for reacting to their music and calling it trash. This is this is the same 
Not the same, but like, stuck. How would it be served by somebody on crime watch, some villain or criminal going, I know what, I'm so upset with this, I'm going to kill Jill Dando. I don't make no sense at all. Even if it's a contract, there should be a fairly identifiable reason for someone to arrange and pay someone else to kill another. But nevertheless, we examined all the cases reaction. that Jill was involved in, which cases she broadcast and, you know, with the police officers. There was, there was just simply no evidence for it. And then the rumours started circulating that... Uh, of course, the sun started it. Maybe she had been not just, not just killed, not just murdered, but actually assassinated. Police confirm a death threat against the head of BBC News is being investigated by detectives leading the hunt for Jill Dando's killer. Tony Hall was one of the first to express his shock at the murder of Jill Dando on Monday. It's my mum. Well, we're all uh, absolutely devastated by... by we had three calls as I uh, recall to the BBC switchboards in uh... Yeah, yeah, this is a scary world, man. This is a scary world that we're living in. And the chances that we're living in this world are already slim to none. Like, the, the, the fact that we're here is a miracle. You know what I'm saying? The fact that we're here is a miracle. You know, and then for people to be out here playing with people's lives like this is crazy. You know how, 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 if you really put it in perspective of how, how fragile we are as a human race, like, these bones, this skin, like, when you get a cut, like, 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 how easy it is to get a cut, like, we're fragile. And we're definitely more fragile emotionally than physically, which is even scarier. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You hurt somebody's feelings, they're going to come for you physically. Like, that's wild. Uh, in London and uh, Belfast, I listened to the voice of, of one of them, which said, basically, I was next. I mean, they were threatening uh, me. I have no idea um, what that amounted to. Was it a, a real threat? Was it not a threat? It's a fact. You know, th th they're often copycat uh, <laughs> things that happen after these sort of events, and the police took it seriously, but I don't know. Speculation remains high. She was the target of a Serbian professional killer responding to the NATO bombing of their television station in Belgrade. By the time it was light, the full extent of the destruction was clear. Videotape fluttered from the trees nearby. My mother did tell me, the it's Serbs deep. had said, when we bombed their um, broadcasting station, that we'd killed the Jill Dando of, of Serbia. The fact that it might have been a tit-for-tat reprisal, then I can understand that that might have been the case, particularly since the way Jill was killed made me think it represented something bigger than the actual act. It doesn't mean to say that that was what happened, but I can see that that, that was what happened. Yeah, that seems like a legit reason. Out of all the log books, not legit reason, but it sounds like a good, like, theory. Here we go. This is uh, the decisions which relate to sensitive issues. I remember way down the line making inquiries with the security services and the intelligence branches and to see whether they had any information or intelligence in respect of, is it really likely that somebody from Serbia traveled all the way to England to kill Miss Dando, very unlikely really. Is it likely then that someone in Serbia or wherever contacted someone here to tell her to this? There you go, sounds plausible. She yeah. must be killed. If there was some information, I'm sure we would have been told. Well, I know we would have been told, but there wasn't any. The Serbian link was pretty quick to be able to close that down through international intelligence opportunities. But it was one that was, I think, foisted on the investigation team um, and was held to be true. And some people was still aver today that it's, uh, you know, that was the case, but no evidence was, was found. I can think of many cases where 
a darker conspiracy is offered up and suggested, which turns out actually to be, unfortunately, somewhat more mundane and boring. Who's it? But always to say, you know, what do you actually know? What do you really know? And that was the key here. What was what was the actual evidence? And that was it. from twenty-two minutes in. Y'all ain't got nothing. He's back to the crime scene. There we go. Do some police work. How about you know what I'm saying? They be killing me when I be watching these documentaries, and they be going through every other step a step the basics. Like start with a base and work your way up. Like. Let's come on. This this is the casing which was found at the crime scene. One of the features of this casing were these little indentations. There were six of them going round the circumference. So there was, there was something odd about it. Someone had obviously done it by hand. It was one of the features which didn't reveal. Yeah, that's what I was looking at, the, the casing. It's like a hand crimper. Common in London, right? Professionalism. The brass cartridge case has a series of tiny indentations around the top edge. This picture shot by the forensic team shows those dents in a straight line, an indication that the bullet may have been tampered with or explosive powder removed to deaden the sound of the shot. If this is a professional organized... Mm. Okay, that might explain why there was no sound there. Or less sound. But when you take out the, 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 the powder, you gotta get up close because that's going to take away the velocity of the bullet shooting this individual or gang only had one bullet to fire and the one bullet they managed to fire had to be put together you know what was that about in terms of firing of a, in a professional capacity firing and then leaving the signature bullet behind that that was itself a, an odd, odd feature as well Police know the weapon used in the murder was a semi-automatic handgun, similar to this one. But detectives are still reluctant to place too much emphasis on theories that a contract killer carried out the attack. There was a view that the person responsible was likely more to be a sort of individual act rather than an organized criminal network planned hit. That wasn't the thinking. The post-mortem report, um, the nature of the injury to her head, the markings there indicated that a silencer couldn't have been on the gun. Because it went through the barrel, the bullet went through a... Okay, so no silencer. Bullet tampered with to make it quiet, okay. Questions are being answered. A single operator They always say that most people who are killed are killed by someone they know. When this situation happens, you think about every possibility and, that's her cousin. and okay. everybody becomes a suspect. You question everything and you question everybody's motives and you think about every single person in turn and think, could they have been the one that did it? So this is all um, Jill's special memories. It's a record of her career. This was put together by a friend of hers. So you can see that the cuttings are cuttings that have been made by someone else. And then this, this was given to, to Jill. And that's just typical of the sort of thing that um, Jill would get. I can't bear to get rid of it because it was everything in here was so important to her. But also, um, I think it's her legacy. And um, I think for my daughter's sake, I want us to have this. And I, we don't know what we'll do with it, but someday we might. And if... No, I feel that. I feel that. Happy, hold on.
<sighs> In my old age, um, which I thought I'd spend with Jill, um, it would be nice to go through the stuff. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. It's understandable that you're getting emotional. She was always seemed sensible. She was always nicely dressed, always interested in everybody else, um, always very kind to people. Uh, and you never saw a horrible side to her at all. And, and she wasn't too good to be true. This is really who Jill was. She didn't have any enemies. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> um, why would they? Why would they target Jill? What possible reason could anybody have for doing that? Except, of course, the fact that she was in the public eye. The public do love you because some people in your position could suffer from being overexposed, and well, it's yes. not a problem with you. We could we could take even more of you. Well, I don't know about that. No, there is a danger. There is a danger. I mean, yeah, there's Crime Watch, the holiday program, and the six o'clock news. And I realised when I when I took on Crime Watch as the extra job, I thought, well, people are going to get tired. Uh, maybe they are, but um, I, I enjoy it. And it's, I think there's enough diversity in the in the programmes for people not to think, oh gosh, you know, it's her again. It's sort of I'm a bit of a chameleon. Maybe yeah. I can sort of adapt to the various roles, hopefully. But I, I, I love it. Hmm. Did she talk to you about her previous stories? Not that I can remember in particular detail, but um, I do know every now and again there were people who um, she found... Uh, she wanted to be nice to everybody, and sometimes she found it difficult to be nice to everybody. That's a fact. You can't be nice to everybody, man. You can't be nice to everybody in this game, in that type of game, because people get to, you, since they see you, especially as a TV personality, Steve Harvey, like I was watching him and he made a point, like when people see you on TV and you're a TV star and not a movie star, you're a TV star, they see you every day, they invite you every day into, your, into their home. So when they see you and when you speak to them, they take, they, 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 it's more like they, they feel like they know you. They like, oh my god, Jill Dando, remember? Da, 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 da. Like they want to have them type conversations with you. And if you ignore them, it feels like like dang, I watch you every day and that's how you repay me? Like it's like they take they, they take it more personally. Wow. When they were making her life difficult. Um, I can't think of any particular examples, but I know that they were there. Jill Dando had two lives. She had her public life and she had her private life. It's entirely possible that her public life was the stimulus for someone killing her. The theory that it was a singular individual working on their own did include the type of person who may be stalking Dando or obsessed with her or following her or besetting her. We, we didn't know but the literally thousands of letters that she received. And within that, there were some, well, there's no other word, but some odd letters that she did receive. And there was one individual um, who were clearly obsessed with her and, and stalking her. The police have also approached the national- <laughs> Fell in love with her. National crime faculty at Brams Hill in Hampshire for assistance. There they can get access to expert psychological advice, which will allow them to develop a profile of the killer. The psychologist, report help with the type of background he would likely have or experience he may have or convictions he may or may not have what do you mean by a loner we all know people who are you know not very gregarious do you mean you know as, as that witness said a bit of a funny one yes there is something odd about him but he might be alone but isolated either emotionally isolated not married having difficulty with previous relationships with girlfriends there will be an obviousness about this this separate, separate away from society and groups of people. And when you say obsession about Jill, I mean, millions of people are fans of Jill, but you mean something very, very particular. Gowan Avenue is, is, is a typical residential street in West London. It's tightly packed with terrace houses, cars parked either side of the road. On the morning of the shooting, there must have been nearly 80 people passing through Gowan Avenue. At the actual time of the shooting, there was none. 
And you know what's crazy? West London, he said. From what y'all told me about West London, West London is like, it's very rich, it's very posh. But at the same time, the hood is like very, very close. <clears throat> but you know, in my mind, the, the hood ain't do this. <clears throat> Who ain't There's a next this. door neighbor here who saw a man leaving from the direction of 29 Gallon Avenue. So somebody seen it? I heard the scream. You heard this? I did hear a, a, a scream. Did, did you hear a man's voice or anything no, like no that? No man's voice at all. And did you hear a shot or did you? Well, it was no shots. You saw this man yourself. I, I have a particular vision of the, of the guy. Yes, I did see him. What, 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 what exactly was he doing? Where? How close were you? What did he do? What did he do? He walked very calmly away from the scene, and when I actually saw him, I thought nothing of it. I thought, in fact, it could have been a friend of Jill's when I heard the screaming. That's why I did. I particularly at that at that moment didn't do anything that now I wish I could have done. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. You're capping. Get off the screen. He didn't hear it. I don't believe him. <laughs> gunshot, and he didn't react to the scream. The, the scream or the cry was indicative of something to us that Jill Dando had, had clearly in those last moments recognized danger, seen danger, and was reacting to it. Otherwise, why scream? As far as one can be certain of anything, the man walking Jake, away at a relatively yeah. fast pace was the person who had killed Jill Dando. The Invisible Monks? This is BBC One, a happy new year. 250 days after the murder? This is a, this is a high profile 200, okay. There's growing concern, the inquiry is beginning to falter and with no immediate prospect of an arrest, detectives are increasingly under pressure to come up with a result. Sometimes I felt we were a day away from solving it and other times I thought, no, we're, we're a long way away. Other senior officers, you know, they were asking, what are, what are the likelihoods of this case being resolved? Chick-fil-A. How much had been pumped into the inquiry by that point? Well, it's a considerable, considerable sum of money, really. We have something like uh, 700 sort of witness statements that have been made and, and something like uh, 7,000 uh, sort of faxes and uh, telephone calls that have been received. Information that all has to be gone through very carefully. We had over 2,000 people named as potential suspects or responsible. Some actions to trace and eliminate one person might take a day. One action might take two weeks. But there's thousands of them. That's the issue of managing stranger homicides. You're looking at it and thinking, how do you know which, which one is it is right then? After Jill Dando was gunned down on her doorstep, no one has been charged with her murder. The police are suggesting more strongly than ever that it was a stalker who shot her. I remember writing in one of my decision logs that maybe the answer lies in the single loner individual. How is it we've spent all this time all this media attention, all this information, and we haven't heard a single thing, really, as to the, who, who it is. Because y'all, and that this y'all not so far, y'all not even going in the right direction, in my opinion. This is not an average person. <laughs> Absence of anything good is because of that's who it might be. A return to the loner, the infatuated, the psychopath, the disturbed, or the obsessed. They're all equally capable of planning good luck and the ability to hurt and harm. My own notes show that this is the most likely explanation. The witnesses of the 26th of April and the earlier days show a man loitering in the street. Can it really be possible that this is 10 or 15 different men or one man seen through different eyewitnesses and lenses, thus explaining the various discrepancies that we have? 
Not only have we not seen one piece of evidence or information to show yeah. Dando was the subject of a contract killing, the location of her death points away from contract. I remember we discussed this. Her attendance at Gowan Avenue is sporadic. It's not the location anyone would choose because there is simply no guarantee or knowledge that she would ever appear there. And it was shortly after that, by coincidence, part of the inquiries that the man Bulsara stroke Gad stroke George came into the inquiry. Appreciate you. Wait, nothing popped up when you did that. I gotta fix that. The person that they came to believe was the uh, the prime suspect, Barry George, had been sitting in their inquiry all along lying in this mass of information that had flooded into the inquiry in the early days. They had these act flooded into the inquiry in the early days. They had these actions that had Possibly. been generated that they never acted on. One of them was to trace, interview and eliminate. Wait, what? Some was the uh, the prime suspect Barry George had been sitting in their inquiry all along prime suspect Barry George has been sitting there inquiry all along okay lying in this mass of information that had flooded into the inquiry in the early days they had these actions that have been generated that they never acted on So he's been in there. Somebody been said something about this dude, but y'all ain't do nothing. One of them was to trace, interview, and eliminate somebody called Barry Bolsaro, I think was the first name that came into the oh inquiry, whose name had been given to them by this little organization to support people with disabilities. It was called HAFAD. Not that far from where Jill Dando lived. He left Hafad and went to uh, to try and get a lift, a, a free lift from a taxi, and he'd been at this taxi company. The taxi company uh, ran completely independently. So we had this guy, again agitated, hanging around soon after the murder and trying to get out of the area, but he didn't have any money. The following day, they rang again and said the same person had come back and tried to plant false alibis and said the same person had come back and tried to plant false alibis. Tried to plant false alibis. So y'all so y'all had this man name in a stack of papers for a year. Didn't even didn't do what y'all was supposed to do until a year later. A year plus later. I just said it at the beginning of this. Like yo Stop. <laughs> do the work that y'all supposed to do. Stop jumping to conclusions and do the proper police work. There was a weakness in the system that they were using now, which has been resolved, that it didn't wasn't an effective method of, of cross-referencing information. But even that, because they didn't have there wasn't a, a single name. It wasn't, you know, Barry no, George, Barry George, Barry George. It was Bolsara, this strange man living in the road with different names coming in. I think the police recognised at the time it was a failure, um, that the significance of them should have become apparent to them sooner. I think you have to see it in the context of, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages coming in. Uh, the uh, I gotta, delay was... I don't got to see it in no context. <laughs> okay, the information is coming at me quickly. Y'all might have had to sift through everything, but that's y'all job. Y'all go to work and get paid to do that. So do it properly. It's unavoidable in comparison with the scale of the work that was required. What? Avoidable. She's coming in. Uh, the uh, delay was unavoidable in comparison with the scale of the work that was required. I've re-examined in detail all that we know of the subject. Some of it has come too slowly to my attention. It represents and answers many of the questions and problems with this investigation. It's therefore essential that he is either eliminated or implicated as quickly as possible. We are one year behind him.
I think as soon as... No cuz, but he looked like he looked guilty. So they interviewed him, then I think he began to loom larger in their considerations. He'd been to jail for attempted rape. He had uh, been convicted of posing as a police officer. He tried to join the police and he'd been rejected and he cut up the rejection letter and tried to create a kind of warrant card out of it. Um, th that doesn't make him a killer, but it's certainly quite odd. It's a weirdo. So we had we had his background. He lived locally. He was, you know, what I would call within the scene almost. Um, and so there were a number of markers which came up to say, let's just pursue this. And that's how I then authorised the authorised the search warrant. From the search of George's house more information came to light and material which caused us to be, and me, certainly extremely concerned about who it was who had come into our inquiry. One of the key things that was found was, was, was many rolls of film, undeveloped, old-fashioned camera film, which we actually obviously got developed, all, all hundreds, hundreds of photographs, of women. Certainly one, maybe two, were in Gowan Avenue. George had notes there of... George was a hoarder. He was a hoarder. Look at this mess. Car numbers of people in the street, local streets near where he lived. The names and addresses, or certainly the addresses and little maps of other women in the local area. So those, those were some of the features in addition to collection of old cuttings on Giordano. He had the Aerial magazine, which was a BBC news magazine. There was an old holster for a weapon in his house, a number of business cars for firearms dealers. In amongst the undeveloped footage film was a photograph of him clearly taken by somebody else holding a, a semi-automatic starting gun. The type of weapon which the forensic scientists a year earlier had indicated would be one of the weapons which could have discharged that bullet. The search didn't reveal a direct link to the killing of Dando, there was, because there was nothing to link. But what it, the search revealed was some circumstantial connections to the crime scene. I ain't gonna lie, buddy is overly weird. One of the witnesses, a number of them talked about a man with a three-quarter length coat or a dark coat and another witness had seen it and then here was a dark three-quarter length coat. And so at that time it was photographed and then it was going to be examined um, for any subsequent forensic trace. When that was subsequently examined, after it had been photographed, there was this, a single particle of gunshot residue in the inside jacket pocket of the coat. Okay, so, okay. Gunshot residue which actually had and contained the same elements of lead, barium, and antimony as the gunshot residue, which was both on the cartridge case and in the head hair of the wound of the Jill Dando. Okay, so what, okay, so what, what are we doing now then? There's no doubt in my investigative mind, it's discovery and reporting added to the situation and the position. I mean, it could have been a firearms particle of a different constituent, because the you know, firearm residue is of different types, types one to five, really. So it was a type two constituent match of the, of the chemical elements. Well, he could just as easily have said, well, actually, it's type one or type four. That would, that would have 
been a, a floundering point as well, but out of all the five types, it was this one. So it, it's, it, but it's, it is one, one piece, but nevertheless, I'm not going to, do, you know, hide. Why do you keep telling me that it could have been this, it could have been that, it could have been this, it could have been that, could have been type one, could have been type four, could have been type five, but that ain't what it was. It was type two. What are we talk? Go back. It's type one. Constituent match of the of the chemical element to five, really. So it was a type two constituent match of the of the chemical elements. Well, he could just as easily have said, "Well, actually, it's type one." But he did it. Type four. That would then that would have been a, a floundering point as well. But out of all the five types, it was this one. Okay. So it, it's it, but it's it is one one piece. But nevertheless, I'm not going to do, you know hide behind the point. I thought it was I thought it had some relevance to the case. Me too. Police hunting Jill Dando's killer have arrested a man on suspicion of murder. One year after the shooting, detectives say it's a highly significant development. Well, the police told us this morning that somebody had been arrested on suspicion of Jill's murder. And, and while we were very interested in that development, uh, like everybody else, we just have to wait and see uh, what progress is now forthcoming. Yeah, my dad and I thought, well, it, it might have been a breakthrough. There, there was evidence, they had evidence, but that it wasn't the end of the story. Well, we know he can be held for 24 hours. After that time, there has to be an extension of a further 12 hours. The decision made to arrest... Oh, so, so they're saying that was circumstantial? Nah, for sure. George was mine, with other senior officers directly involved in that deci decision... ...making. The suspect was brought to the central London police station where he was questioned about the murder of the TV presenter. Did you kill Jill Dango, Mr. George? No, sir. What is your interest in Jill Dango? I don't have any interest in Jill Dango, sir. Funny that when Mr. George was seen and he made his statement, he was very clear where he was and what he had done. When he was arrested, he then changed the account of where he was and moved his timing and what he did quite differently. Did you ever buy the G1458? So he was in there, y'all had evidence. He wasn't sticking to his story. He had already went to the taxi cab to try to cover up what was going on. It's a blank phone, government automatic. No, sir. Have you ever possessed one of those? No, sir. Have you ever handled one of those? No, sir. Have you ever fired one of those? No, sir. Barry George said he never had firearms, owned firearms, used firearms, or discharged firearms. Sure about that? So we were then left with this single piece of invisible gunshot residue in his pocket. But y'all also had the picture, right? I know it's circumstantial, but like, they gotta tie it. I had a picture of him holding the blick. The one that they said that might could be possibly used in the in the, in, the, in that homicide. In my experience, the Crown Prosecution Service doesn't rush to charge unless it feels it has a sufficiency of evidence. That's a fact. Yeah, that's a fact in the UK. And in my personal experience of Hamish, he is a man who will go out of his way to disprove as much as prove because of the gathering of evidence no preconceived ideas. The discovery of the particle and its establishment has the same type of gunshot residue as what was on the casing and her hair. There's just one tiny element in the connecting of all these other factors. It, it, it sat there just as that. Did it contribute towards a decision to charge or decide to charge? Yes, it would have. It would have done, but it wasn't the only factor. Good evening. A man has been charged with the murder of the BBC television presenter Jill Dando. This evening, the detective leading the inquiry left Hammersmith Police Station after charging Barry Bosara with murder under his original name. Barry Michael George. I must admit, I wasn't convinced that he was the person who had done it. Anybody with three first names is, is, is drawing suspicion for me. Buddy, first name is Barry 
His second name is Michael. What, what was it? Yeah. Michael George. With murder under his original name, Barry Michael George. He got three first names. He's very suspicious, in my opinion. All the evidence, then three first names on top of that? Come on, man. What's going on? I must admit, I wasn't convinced that he was the person who had done it. Yeah, I'm good, bro. It just didn't seem completely feasible to me. The cuz wasn't? I think it just seemed, it all seems a little bit contrived. Um, and convenient. There was very much a, a feeling among some, you know, sections of the media that Barry George had been kind of picked on, alighted upon as, uh, you know, the local weirdo, if you like, who uh, the police could drape the case around. Well, there's always been the view in the media and elsewhere that the police chose Barry George somehow as a scapegoat and, for want of a better word, a patsy for the investigation team because we couldn't solve it. And yeah, that, that, like, it's somewhat insulting and it's completely untrue and... It's possible, though. <laughs> like, like, okay, let's not act like that's not never happened before, but... But like with the y'all found a lot of evidence in my my opinion. And wrong. None of the things. I think in this case it's been charged at all. Yeah, I think in this particular case that's not correct, but It was at 1 minute to 11 o'clock that the senior treasury right. counsel, Orlando Pownall for the Crown, began to outline the prosecution case. The trial lasted for something like 52 days of legal argument and evidence. That there are compelling categories of circumstantial and forensic and scientific evidence which, when taken together, prove that the defendant was the man in Gowan Avenue who was responsible for killing Jill Dando. For him to have done it, all the stars would have had to be aligned. People didn't notice that he was walking around with a gun. He would have had to be there at the right time. Uh, how did he know how to do it? There were all these questions where you shoot thought that someone like shoot. Barry George wouldn't have been capable of doing it. The evidence. How you figure? Wait, go back, go back to what? I know this is the cousin, like it's her thought process. To do it that he was walking around with the gun. For him to have done it, all the stars would have had to be aligned. People didn't notice that he was walking around with a gun. It's in his pocket. He has a three-fourth long trench coat on. It's in his pocket. He would have had to be there at the right time. Daytime. Then they was looking for a taxi, right? How did he know how to do it? Point and shoot. It's not, it's not rocket science. There were all these questions where you thought that someone like Barry George wouldn't have been capable of doing it. Barry George got three first names. He was in a picture with a blick, with a mask on. He had an oversized leather coat with a buckle at the bottom. What more did you need from Barry? Like, what are we doing? The evidence has been heard. Now it is being weighed. In the <sighs> Bailey's number one court, counsel for the prosecution and the defense are presenting their final arguments on the guilt or innocence of Barry Michael George. The jury what? The guilt or innocence. Counsel for the prosecution and the now it is being weighed. In the Old Bailey's number one court, counsel for the prosecution and the defense are presenting their final arguments on the guilt or innocence of Barry Michael George. The jury, I think, after being out for something approaching five days, one could see on their faces when they came back into court, there must have been a very difficult decision. Some of them were crying, there was a lot of distress, there was a huge amount of tension in the, in the courtroom. So no one really could predict which way the- This is why I couldn't be, a, I couldn't be one of them, one of the, uh, what, what are the, the jurors. I could never do it. Cause I'm coming back guilty with no, with a straight face. Not a piece of emotion. Verdict might go. Jump into conclusions. It's too much for me. Okay. Guilty. Okay. The day that 
he was found guilty, I, I was in my office and I just sobbed. Um, and I can't tell you why I sobbed. Um, it wasn't relief. Um, it wasn't celebration. I have absolutely no idea how it, what it was, but I think it was just the fact that it marked a point in time through, and it, it was maybe even relief from everything that we'd gone through over the previous couple of years. I was surprised when Barry George was, was convicted. Um, my personal view was that there was evidence on which one could see a conviction, but for me, if I'd been on that jury, I didn't think that the evidence was sufficient to, um, to justify a conviction. Well, she was guilty. I don't know, but... The thing that really uh, sealed his fate in the end was a single particle of firearms residue. When they found a particle, I was always very skeptical of that. As soon as you enter uh, some scientific evidence, which uh, could raise any doubts at all, then there is always the prospect that it crashes and burns. back to prison, his appeal failed, his conviction upheld. They have taken evidence and they've used it and there is no evidence to convict Barry. This is just appalling. If people were to read the information and understand the full facts, I think, like the jury, they would equally be assured that Barry George murdered Miss Dando. Who this? Forensic scientist Angela Shaw. OK, what you got for us, Angela? I'm Angela Shaw. I am a forensic scientist. My area of expertise is in gunshot residue, and I've been an expert in that field for uh, 20, 19 years. 20, 19. Four years later, Barry George's legal team made a new submission to the Criminal Cases Review Committee. Was Barry rich? Yeah, a lawyer's working for a long time. The Criminal Case Review Commission uh, will review any cases where um, the legal party puts forward um, any grounds that they think could mean that the conviction was unsafe. Uh, so it was mid-2006. The Criminal Case Review Commission basically felt that there had been a change in policy by the Forensic Science Service, which, which I was involved in writing, that would change the significance of the weight that was placed on a single particle. We ultimately felt that it wasn't a change, um, but they felt that that had been a significant change. And the Barry George case was a minor influence in writing that document, mainly because there was a disproportionate amount of attention the media placed on the finding of a single particle. In the case of um, the particle found in the pocket of Barry George, we would now categorize that as a type two a uh, gunshot residue particle. Similar particles were found on spent casing, found on the doorstep. Right, we've already been through this. And also on Jill Dandel's hair. What you could say was that they were uh, indistinguishable from each other. They were um, indistinguishable from each other. And therefore, the spent casing could have been a source of the particle in Barry George's coat pocket. Okay, yeah. <laughs> But there was a key question that hadn't been asked at the trial. That was, what was the significance of a single particle in a coat pocket a year after a shooting? If you're travelling around on the London Underground or on a bus, obviously there's a lot of hobby shooters. Um, you have armed police officers who will travel around using public transport. It is rare, but we do estimate that you might pick up a particle. One in a hundred people might pick up a particle unknowingly, which is why we don't put any evidential, ev evidential weight on a single particle. They be bringing the slightest stuff to my attention. I forgot all about that.
Well, how? Okay. A single particle a year later in a coat pocket could not link Barry George to the shooting. My view was, well, okay, there are numerous ways a single particle or any number of us could have got into his pocket. And they're all, all but one of them must be legitimate and, you know, fair, inadvertent contamination. Now, she did have a great point. That was a solid point. I'm mad that I said all that and then she brought it to my attention with seven minutes left in the video. video. You know what I'm saying? I didn't talk bad about Barry. I still low-key... Hey, listen. He's been to somewhere or bumped into somebody who has gunshot residue and so it's gone. They're all, they're all perfectly possible. One other option, of course, was, the, was a more uh, draconian one or dramatic one. Was it in fact, he got it from firing a gun, but you can't say that. It has no value on its own. It doesn't say that he was or he wasn't the person involved in the shooting. So it's going to have to be disallowed. It doesn't prove involvement in the shooting. So that got thrown out, that piece of evidence, is that what he's saying? And therefore, case overturned. Inconclusive and... Ah, okay. Barry George is clear of the murder of CJ. He's a free man tonight after eight years, but his sister says the family's finally found justice. They've finally got justice. Yes, that's fine. Did she just practice? <laughs> Barry George is clear of the murder of CJ. He's a free man tonight after eight years, but his sister says the family's finally found justice. They've finally got justice. Yes, that's fine. He served eight years, though? Honestly, if Barry wasn't guilty of this, he was guilty of something. And the man did his time. George is a free man tonight, cleared of the murder of the TV presenter Jill Dando. We've been fighting for many years. Now we need time to get back together as a family. We also hope that the police will now look again into the murder of Jill Dando. Thank you. Wrongfully convicted. Oh, that's, that's hearsay. Throughout this trial, his defense had maintained that this is a man with serious psychological problems and a very low intellect. That made him incapable of carrying out this crime. Now, Scotland Yard say they stand by their methods. The first thing I want to say is that we're disappointed at today's verdict, but we're especially disappointed for Jill's family and friends. However, we accept and respect the decision of the court this afternoon. You, you know, you move on, but you don't forget. It was hard work. It was a commitment and energy and drive by everybody to try to find a real resolution to the case. But you didn't for this one. In the end. We, as an investigation team, brought someone before the courts and that is what we had to do so we we made the investigation came to a conclusion and submit the evidence you know the outcome is, is entirely out of our hands you're either guilty or you're not guilty it's not really determining whatever you mean by innocence so those are those are those are decisions made by the court and that's what we have to live with When Barry George was, was finally acquitted on the evidence the jury heard, I, I think he was rightly acquitted. I'd have acquitted him. Without that single piece of, you know, that particle of firearms residue, one can see what a dent that made to the evidence against him, because that was really the only thing that connected him to the actual event. Whether one does or doesn't believe Barry George did it, Barry George is an innocent man. 
in the eyes of the law, and that is the end of the discussion. Who you? Who is this? You coming over here talking about like you know what I'm saying? Who is, go back. Whether one does or doesn't believe Barry George did it, Barry George is an innocent man in the eyes of the law, and that is the end of the discussion. I mean that's a fact, but like dang. Do you ever think that it'll get solved? So, so it's unsolved now. 2008, what's that? 12, 15 years ago? Do I think somebody will come back to court? Probably not. No. Do you think that someone new might come to court? No. No. Unsolved. That's crazy. I would like to see somebody charged and convicted. But I would just like to know. It's too late now. It's 24 years ago. Oh, why someone would want to kill her. You know, I, I would like somebody. It's over with. The person who did it to be able to tell me or to be able to tell a, a jury or a judge why it happened. And that would be fine. He probably got his karma already. He probably is unalived somewhere. That would uh, that would put my mind at rest and that would be the closure for me. Do you think that you ever will? Uh, I remain hopeful that that, that will happen. Um, we're 20 years on now, so it's the, the odds are against it, but uh, but I live in hope. It's a sad place to live. We, in the general sense, have been left unfulfilled by what could have been her ongoing potential. And I think that she was on a journey. And she would have still been out here probably being great. She was only halfway up that mountain. What is raw when it happens is less raw, uh, much less raw, 20 years on. But I'm really proud that we have the Jill Dando Institute in, in Jill's name, from undergraduates through to masters and PhD students, doctorates. We've got people who are looking at uh, forensics and particularly in flaws of forensics, how they can mislead us. And we're trying to support police in bringing much, much more preventative effort to crime. She'd be proud of it, immensely proud of it, I'm, I'm sure. And that stands as a, a lasting legacy to her. The moment that changed all of our lives was that moment when that happened and Jill was killed. You would like to hold somebody accountable, but um, it won't change things. Whoever did that is still around, and, you, and I'm not convinced that you can hide something like that forever. But we'll see. This is a W way to end, man. I feel like I went through all my emotions in this one. <laughs> I was convinced that John Jacob Jingleheimer Smith did it. What was his name? Uh, John George Michael? Something. That's crazy, though, man. TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, man. Let me know in the comments if y'all thought he was guilty, because I definitely thought he was. I'm gone.